All right, well, welcome to the final lecture on poetry. And uh, this chapter, uh, number 13, I believe, on sound, uh, and then 14 on internal structure, and 15 uh, on external form. Uh, I'll be going over uh, in this lecture um, the canvas page doesn't actually have all of that uh, listed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we'll be just jumping around uh, from chapter to chapter uh, and topic to topic here. Uh, so this first um, chapter is on the sounds of poetry. Uh, and early on in these lectures, you know, I, I told you, uh, you know, it's important to read the poems out loud. Uh, and if you haven't been doing that, uh, you know, you've been missing out on the sounds of these poems. Um, and exactly, you know, how those poem or how those sounds relate to the meanings of poems uh, is something that uh, this poem by Alexander Pope, uh, which uh, I believe is listed in the text as sound and sense, but is actually part of a larger poem um, called An Essay on Criticism by Alexander Pope, uh, talks about uh, how sound and sense, right, how the sounds of a poem and the sense of a poem, its meaning, and the meanings of the words and the sentences, uh, should relate to each other, or at least how they can and do and should. He eventually gives advice um, as to, to how they can relate to one another. All right, so I'll read this and sort of interpret as I go along. Uh, because it is old, it may uh, not be immediately recognizable, um, sort of the, the sense of what he's saying. He's saying, But most by numbers judge a poet's song, and smooth or rough with them is right or wrong. Right? Most judge a poet's song by its meter, right? how uh, the rhythm goes, right? And if that rhythm is perfect, right? Um, so technically perfect, right? If you can have the right number of syllables in your line, the stressed and unstressed, uh, so, uh, you know, it's sort of perfectly put together um, like a one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, right? Uh, those are um, I am's, right? Or, um, so you've got uh, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, uh, stressed, unstressed. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Uh, you know, the colors are always stressed. The um, uh, fish is always unstressed, right? Uh, so, you know, if you can make your perfect line exactly how you want it, and it's regular, right? It's the same over and over again, and it's clear what you're doing, and you're doing it well, then that's how people judge a good poet or a good poem is by the numbers, right? And listen to this, but most by numbers judge a poet's song, and smooth or rough with them is right or wrong. Listen to how it, the difficulty of pronouncing that line uh, makes it rough, right? Um, and smooth or rough, I mean, just read it and, and read those two lines and see which is the more difficult to pronounce, right? That second one does not roll off the tongue. Uh, there are lots of stops, and if I were a linguist, I'd be able to tell you exactly why and how those sounds are formed in the mouth and why, you know, and smooth or, right right there, you have to make that oh sound, that voiced um, vowel sound, smooth or rough. You know, so you can't, in order to distinguish those two words, you have to stop between the R's or rough with there's a comma, so there's another stop. With them is right or wrong. Again, you have that R sound being split up. So it's hard. It's hard to say. And why is it hard to say? Right? Most by numbers judge a poet's song, and smooth or rough with them is right or wrong. He makes that line rough, right? Uh, so immediately, oh, this is a bad poem, right? But he's trying to make a point. Right? Um, do you always love a song or a poem because it's beautifully put together and it sounds beautiful um, and it's nice and smooth and you know some I think of like Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven or something like that. You love it because it's beautiful, it's smooth, it sort of runs together perfectly um, and it's about you know sort of graceful moonlit night then yeah 
you know, you love it for that, right? Um, but what if something's rough, right? Do you automatically just dismiss it, or is there a purpose to it, right? If you're listening to Metallica instead, there's a different kind of roughness there, or, you know, um, like punk rock, right, or something. Uh, you enjoy it for different reasons at different times, right? Uh, sort of what he's getting at, right? In the bright muse, though thousand charms conspire, her voice is all these tuneful fools admire. Uh, right, these charming things, people just love it because it's beautiful. They're, they're fools, right? They just love the music. Who haunt Parnassus but to please the ear. Right? I'm only going to these uh, beautiful places or, you know, beautiful places where beautiful music happens to please my ear, not mend their minds as some to church repair, not for the doctrine, but the music. You're not going for the doctrine. You're not like like you would go to church. You're not going to poetry to mend something in your mind, but you're going just to listen to the music. He says that's a problem, right? Um, that's incorrect. Right? Uh, they're they're fools who go to poetry only for the music. These equal syllables alone require. Though oft the ear, the open vowels tire. Um, lots of open vowels in that line. Right? Uh, and the equal syllables, the syllables are the same. Both those lines have ten syllables. Uh, but the second one right, is tiring to the ear. Though oft the ear, the open vowels tire. Uh, your mouth gets tired just saying that. <laughs> While expletives their feeble aid do join, and ten low words oft creep in one dull line. And those two uh, same consonant sounds, dull and line, uh, that you have to stop to pronounce so clearly. And there are ten words in that uh, line, uh, just as he says there are, and uh, they're creeping along dully, all right while they ring round the same unvaried chimes with sure returns of still expected rhymes. Uh, you know, expected rhymes, things that are cliché, right? Uh, Where'er you find the cooling western breeze, in the next line it whispers through the trees. If crystal streams with pleasing murmurs creep, the readers threatened, not in vain, with sleep. Uh, these are just the tired old lines and rhymes that people come up with. And you um, you hear this like in rap, right? Like if you, if you listen to rap um, and someone comes up with a really uh, fresh rhyme, right? It's awesome, right? And uh, a lot of times it'll even include people like ooing and eyeing over the rhyme. I can't believe he just did that. How did he do that? How did he rhyme? Uh, you know, it's... Uh, you like to see that sort of innovation as opposed to the simple expectation uh, and, you know, being promised or th really threatened, right, with those dull rhymes that are over and over again. Uh, they're so cliche. Then, at the last, an only couplet fraught with some unmeaning thing they call a thought, a needless Alexandrine ends the song that, like a wounded snake, drags its slow length along. We may talk about what an Alexandrine is, and we'll see that that's what he's included there, and it's dumb, <laughs> right? He says it's just it's like a wounded snake. Uh, it's too long, and we're done with it, and it's useless. Uh, leave such to tune their own dull rhymes, and know what's roundly smooth or languishingly slow. And praise the easy vigor of a line, where Denham's strength and Waller's sweetness join. And this is really where he begins his advice to poets. He says, True ease in writing comes from art, not chance, as those move easiest who have learned to dance. It doesn't come from just uh, mimicking and sort of this... Uh, endless pattern that you can hear and you don't ever manipulate. It's it's an art form and it is uh, something that requires a little bit of study and a little bit of practice um, in order to really become easy with the form. 
of a poem. Um, Tis not enough no harshness gives offense. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. Um, it's not enough that it's just pretty. The sound needs to, it has effects, right? There are sound effects in poetry. And you use those effects for purposes, right? The purposes have to do with the meaning. Right? Um, so soft is the strain when Zephyr gently blows, and the smooth stream in smoother numbers flows. But when loud surges lash the sounding shore, the hoarse rough verse should like the torrent roar. When Ajax strives some rock's vast weight to throw, the line too labors and the words move slow. Not so when swift Camilla scours the plain, flies o'er the unbending corn and skims along the main. Hear how Timotheus varied lays surprise and bid alternate passions fall and rise. If you can't hear the ways that the sound is echoing the sense uh, here, um, read them again, <laughs> right? And hear about slowly or quickly or thrashing, right, in the hoarseness um, and how the sound is echoing the sense in all of these lines. Hear how Timotheus varied laid surprise and bid alternate passions fall and rise while at each change the son of Libyan Jove now burns with glory and then melts with love. How his, now his fierce eyes with sparkling fury glow. Now sighs steal out and tears begin to flow. Persians and Greeks like turns of nature found, and the world's victor stood subdued by sound. The power of music all our hearts allow, and what Timotheus was is Dryden now. Dryden was a, a contemporary of Pope, uh, Pope the author of this poem, uh, whom Pope is praising here as sort of the master of being able to um, make the sound echo the sense uh, of his poems. Uh, so let's look at another example example from the chapter uh, of how sort of sound works in a poem. Uh, what are the sound effects, right? Uh, so this is a, a poem called Dolce et Decorum Est by Wilfram Owen, Wilfred Owen, uh, written, I believe, in... Let's see, well, oh, this is 1921, but I believe it may have been 1917. I think it was still during the war, uh, the World War I, uh, but I could be wrong about that. You can probably check the date in the book. Um, but, uh, you know, Dolce et Decorum Est, uh, it, Pro Patria Mori, is the uh, famous Latin line, meaning sort of. Uh, it is sweet and right uh, to die for one's country. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Men had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick, boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of skin, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, 
bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. Right, so a, a peace poem or an anti-war poem here, um, you know, about World War I uh, and sort of the horrors uh, of war. And, uh, you know, I won't go into all the ways that the, the sound is operating here. I'll leave that to you, um, you know, in the uh, discussion section. Uh, but it's important uh, when thinking about uh, the form here, uh, I think, to go over uh, not just the the sounds of the words being used um, and uh, you know, the, the rhyme that's being used, but also the meter. Right? So I talked about stressed and unstressed syllables. Uh, so I'll go into a little bit um, the, uh, you know, there's a science to it, right? <laughs> a little bit like um, uh, an art, uh, an art and a science, right? Uh, to sound uh, and to the music of poetry just as in, uh, you know, music. And, you know, some poets were also musicians and would, you know, put their uh, songs to music or you know, their written poetry to music. Um, I'm thinking of Gerard Manley Hopkins, who has many poems in this anthology. Uh, it's a good example of one of those who would actually uh, put scansion marks onto his poems. Uh, and so when I'm talking about scansion marks, I'm talking about uh, scanning a poem is putting these marks on the stressed syllables. Uh, so I talked about, you know, an unstressed or unaccented syllable followed by a stressed or accented one uh, being an I am. And actually, I, I messed up earlier when I said one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. That's actually a trochee. Um, so that's the stress comes on the first syllable is followed by the unstressed. Uh, so trochee would be redfish, or one fish, two fish, redfish, bluefish. Right? You can hear the emphasis. Uh, the emphasis is the stress, a stressed syllable. You know, a syllable is that one unit of sound. So syllable. Sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Right? Uh, demonstrates the, you know, how stresses work there. Uh, and, you know, so, uh, again, you know, rappers, uh, you know, are excellent, right? Uh, if you listen to hip-hop at all, uh, you know, this is uh, very much, um, you know, uh, uh, the patterning of stress, uh, you know, that is very separate from sort of normal ways of speaking that operates uh, in hip-hop, uh, where you can hear these stress syllables. Um, so, you know, you've probably heard of iambic pentameter as uh, the way that you know, uh, Shakespeare always writes in iambic pentameter. A lot of his soliloquies and his plays, right, as soon as he's going into iambic pentameter, you can hear it, you know it, and you know that it's sort of an important and poetic part of the play. Um, uh, so iams is the iambic, right? Uh, to be or not to be, right? Uh, that is the question. Uh, the iams. Trochies, uh, stressed, unstressed. It's called troaic or trochaic. Uh, anapests, so that's unstressed, unstressed, stressed. Comprehend, after you. So you can hear, you know, the stress can be somewhat subjective, right? So it's not a, it's not a perfect science, right? Like how things are pronounced. I'm sure if you're going to measure it scientifically, you would hear, you know, differences in volume, um, you know, and force, uh, and, and you know, airflow, and all those sorts of things, right? Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, you, you can develop an ear for it. So whereas no one is probably going to scan, a, you know, a long poem exactly alike, um, unless it's a very highly metered poem, uh, you know, they're going to be similar. A uh, stressed syllable followed by two unstressed is called a dactyl. Um, and the above feet either begin or end with a stressed syllable. So um, if it you know, uh, starts unstressed and goes stressed, uh, it's rising, and the opposite is falling. Um, there are lots of <laughs> terms for these, and I'd be lying if I said that you know, I knew them all or thought about them all as I was reading poems. And uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of work on the great modernist poet T.S. Eliot, uh, largely considered you know, by many 
if not the best, um, you know, uh, top three, uh, for sure, 20th century uh, poets uh, in the English language, he says he never was able to keep him straight, <laughs> right? So it's less important uh, that you uh, know the names for these, uh, but that you can recognize um, that they exist and think about how the stresses seem to be operating, um, you know, to certain effects uh, within a poem. Uh, so things that uh, are highly regular, you know, I think about um, my Papa's Waltz, you know, the poem we read by Theodore Rothke, and how there's a very strong, consistent beat, um, you know, th throughout that poem, uh, like a waltz, and yet the chaos that's happening, you know, the ways that that actually serves as a contrast uh, between the sound and the sense uh, that um, sort of gets at a little bit the the contrast of how he feels, uh, the love that he feels towards his abusive alcoholic father. Father, uh, you know, really interesting contrasts happening there. Uh, so, you know, I'll skip ahead here um, to talk about um, the, the one that sort of demonstrates external form, since we've been talking about uh, those uh, formal features. Uh, Do not go gentle into that good night is very um, it's a villanelle, uh, which is a very structured form. Um, you know, we talk, uh, we haven't talked about sonnets or uh, limericks or some of these um, forms that have uh, become uh, traditional, uh, you know, and that many people write in these forms. You know, Shakespeare wrote in sonnets. Petrarch uh, wrote sonnets. Um, uh, Robert Frost uh, would write a lot of sonnets. It's 14 lines uh, composed of either... Um, uh, let's see, it would be 4, 4, 4, and 2, uh, or it would be, um, let's see if I'll get this right, 6, 6, 6, um, no, no, that would be wrong, right, uh, 6, 6, and 2, uh, no, I'm totally messing that up, uh, obviously, uh, don't pay a, a whole lot of attention to these formal, uh, features, uh, of these poems, but this one, in particular, the villanelle is, is, largely considered one of the very hardest uh, of uh, poetic forms to write in. Um, and uh, it has highly patterned repetitions of certain lines uh, throughout. Um, and I think the way that Dylan, it's, it's hard to write a successful villanelle. All right? I've read some really bad ones. <laughs> um, you know, even ones that are sort of picked out to be good that I think are terrible. <laughs> Uh, this one, I think, is good in the sense that it's able to sort of mean something slightly different um, every time that you read the same line. And I think that that's sort of a key, uh, at least in my mind, to making uh, some of these older traditional forms uh, work in, in sort of our time. This is a very famous poem by, by Dylan Thomas. Uh, someone actually told me, a student, that uh, Jeezy... Uh, the rapper uses it in one of his albums, uh, so you can always check him out uh, using a couple lines from it. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end know dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Right, so he's saying, what's his attitude towards, we can assume he's talking about death here, right? old age, right? the closing of the day, rage against the dying of the light, right? hold on to life. Right? And even wise men, you know, at their end, they know that dark is right. They know death is inevitable, it's coming, because their words had forged no lightning. What is he saying there, right? Like, um, because you didn't make a difference, you weren't heard. Your words didn't make a difference. Do not go gentle into that good night. They do not go gentle. He's describing, right? Um, the first stanza he seems to be uh, addressing, do not do this, right? The second stanza, he says, they do not go gentle. He's describing them. Good men, also, the last wave by, 
crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. To me here, he's still describing, right? So wise men, good men, right? The good men, they know that their deeds have been frail and they might have had greater deeds. They might have danced in a green bay. They might have had experiences, uh, but they've been good. They've tended to their obligations, what have you. They rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Um, even wild men, even men who, who seem to have relished the moment, right, um, but had nothing of the sort of grievance, had nothing of the sadness, uh, sort of beautiful sadness of the mortality or something like that, um, they also do not go gentle into that good night, right? Um, they too, no one, no one can go gently. Um, you know, at first he's telling us not to, and now he's describing all these people who don't go gently into the good night and who rage against the dying of the light. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay rage, rage against the dying of the light. Um, even men who feel the gravity of death, who are near death, and who see with blinding sight that blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay, um, that there's so much possibility in life compared to non-life, right? Um, that they could, his eyes, even blind eyes, could blaze like meteors and be gay. Um, and you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. He's writing this to his father. Um, his father was dying at the time. There on the sad height, he's there at the end, right? Uh, curse or bless me now with your fierce tears. It's a curse and it's a blessing. That knowledge of death is coming. It's final. Uh, I don't think there's any afterlife here for Tom, uh, Dylan Thomas. Um, you know, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Cling to life. It's all we have. Um, it's, it's somehow beautiful and vital, even in its diminishing. Uh, lots to talk about in that poem. You know, we could read it every time and then get something a little bit different out of it, which is what makes things classics, I think. Um, why this poem has a lot of staying power. All right, uh, so, uh, you know, you could look at, uh, you know, the ways that the different lines repeat and look at, uh, you know, look up in the book, back in the book, it'll tell you what a villanelle uh, is, um, sort of how things work with villanelles uh, and the form. Um, and this is a very traditional form um, with a modern uh, twist and meaning uh, that really, uh, I think, works very well. So th those are all sort of aspects of external form. I'm sorry, some of these... Um, Websites are so obnoxious with their advertisements and things like this. Uh, but uh, I guess that's what you get for, for free poetry sometimes. Uh, so this poem, The Victims, uh, again by Sharon Olds, who, whom we've uh, looked at a lot, uh, is, a, is a good demonstration, I think, of internal form. Uh, so you're talking about external form. Uh, some of them have very traditional forms. You could say, okay, that's a sonnet, that's a limerick, that's a villanelle, that's a sestina, uh, what, what have you. Um, with internal form, you're making an argument, uh, if you want to make an argument about uh, the poem, you, you're sort of observing things about shifts, um, you know, we talked about tonal shifts or shifts in meaning, shifts in context or, or what have you, um, and this uh, one I think demonstrates, you know, if you're going to argue uh, that this could be broken up into parts, 
you know, I think um, it'd be something to, to talk about in the discussion board. Uh, when, when are the different parts? Where would you segment it, right? If you were going to put it in different parts, the victims. When mother divorced you, we were glad. She took it and took it in silence all those years, and then kicked you out suddenly, and her kids loved it. Then you were fired. And we grinned inside, the way people grinned when Nixon's helicopter lifted off the South Lawn for the last time. We were tickled to think of your office taken away, your secretaries taken away, your lunches with three double bourbons, your pencils, your reams of paper. Would they take your suits back, too, those dark carcasses hung in your closet, and the black noses of your shoes with their large pores? She had taught us to take it to hate you and take it until we pricked with her for your annihilation, father. Now I pass the bums in doorways, the white slugs of their bodies gleaming through slits in their suits of compressed silt, the stained flippers of their hands, the underwater fire of their eyes, ships gone down with the lanterns lit. And I wonder who took it and took it from them in silence, until they had given it all away and had nothing left but this. So where would you segment that poem if you were going to split it in stanzas? You know, what are the different parts of you know, sort of units of sense, right? The, if a line is like a unit of sound, uh, where is the unit of sense that you would sort of break things into stanzas? Um, and, and, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, as you're looking at poems, sometimes the, the unit of sense will sort of overlap from the end of one stanza to the beginning of another, or sort of go halfway, right? Interesting segmenting of, of poems, you know, into these units of external and internal structure um, can sort of uh, have their own uh, effects, you know, if you really get into to reading poetry, you know, you notice these things, and it's things that sort of make you go, huh, right, and your ears prick up, and... Um, can, when you hear something new in a, in a song, right, um, or new guitar effect or something, right, you, you perk up, you listen, um, you know, so, uh, you know, also the, the meaning of take it and took in this poem, right, uh, changes. Again, obnoxious uh, website, but I hope that you'll, you'll bear with it. This is the last poem I'll talk about. It's called Church Going by Philip Larkin. Once I'm sure there's nothing going on, I step inside, letting the door thud shut. Another church, matting, seats and stone and little books, sprawlings of flowers cut for Sunday. Brownish now, some brass and stuff up at the holy end. The small, neat organ and a tense, musty, unignorable silence. Brood God knows how long. Hatless, I take off my cycle clips in awkward reverence. Move forward, run my hand around the font. From where I stand, the roof looks almost new, clean or restored. Someone would know. I don't. Mounting the lectern, I peruse a few hectoring large-scale verses and pronounce here endeth much more loudly than I'd meant. The echoes snigger briefly. Back at the door, I sign the book, donate an Irish sixpence, Reflect the place was not worth stopping for. Yet stop I did. In fact, I often do and always end much at a loss like this, wondering what to look for, wondering, too, when churches will fall completely out of use. What shall we turn them into? What we shall turn them into if we shall keep a few cathedrals chronically on show, their parchment, plate, and picks in locked cases, and let the rest rent free to rain and sheep. Shall we avoid them as unlucky places? Or, after dark, will dubious women come to make their children touch a particular stone, pick simples for a cancer, or on some advised night see walking a dead one? Power of some sort will go on in games and riddles, seemingly at random, but superstition, like belief, must die. And what remains when disbelief has gone? Grass, weedy pavement, brambles, buttress, sky. A shape less recognizable each week, a purpose more obscure. 
I wonder who will be the last, the very last, to seek this place for what it was. One of the crew that tap and jot and know what rude lofts were, some ruin bibber, brandy for antique, or Christmas addict, counting on a whiff of gown and bands and organ pipes and myrrh, or will he be my representative? Bored, uninformed, knowing the ghostly silt dispersed, yet tending to this cross of ground through suburb scrub because it held unsplit so long and equably what since is found only in separation, marriage and birth and death and thoughts of these, for which was built this special shell. For though I've no idea what this accounted frowsty barn is worth, it pleases me to stand in silence here. A serious house on serious earth it is, in whose blent air all our compulsions meet, are recognized and robed as destinies. And that much never can be obsolete, since someone will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious, and gravitating with it to this ground, which, be once heard, was proper to grow wise in, if only that so many dead lie round. So again, the external form we see uh, the rhyme, we see the metered lines, um, and so you could scan these and sort of see what the meter is like throughout the poem. You could do the rhyme scheme, right? So we have um, on and stone, sort of a slant rhyme or an off rhyme, they call it. Uh, so um, going on, shut, stone, cut, stuff, organ, silence, off, reverence, so we have sense and reverence, um, off and stuff, uh, font, don't, new, few, pronounce, meant, door, sixpence, four. Um, so look at those aspects of external form and the sort of regularity uh, and you know, uh, reading it from the beginning you think uh, you know this is a man who sort of casually goes into a church um, and is contemplating its uh, superstition and really believes that um, you know, sort of that religion is uh, you know eventually just going to die out and what are we going to do with all these churches uh, and yet at the end um, you know, he's thinking about it, he's thinking about death, and he's thinking about marriage and birth and death, and thoughts of these, um, in this sort of special shell built to sanctify aspects of life that would remain important, um, these questions of life and death that would remain important, and always, uh, someone uh, will forever be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious, and gravitating with it to this ground. Serious house, like serious earth, or sort of moral seriousness uh, that will never get old, whatever one's belief seems to be saying. So, so where do you start to see those shifts uh, happening, right, in your expectations and in the meaning? Um, you know, if you were going to re stanza to this somehow, you know, how would you argue about which section belongs where? Uh, so those are the sorts of questions, right? I mean, the, the poem uh, is the result of choice, right? And so, you know, your argument is always that it's there, right? The author put that word there. The author, um, you know, decided uh, that it should be exactly like this uh, and left it like that, right? Put it out, uh, you know, sent it somewhere to be published like that. Um, so, you know, you can make your arguments based on what's there and the perceived intention. Uh, you know, without really needing to argue that that's what the author was really doing, just saying this is this is what's here. This is the effect uh, that it has on me. This is the best way I think uh, to read what's being said here. Um, and that's how you can make your arguments uh, for your interpretations of poems. Uh, so I'll look forward to seeing those in the discussion board uh, as well as in your papers. Thanks for listening to this last lecture on poetry.